Good evening, everyone, and hello, future home owners. My name is Ron Sharma. I'm a financial advisor with RBC. Uh, I work at Elgin and Lisker Branch. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here on behalf of RBC, uh, your go-to financial godparent and the magical realm of first-time home buying. Uh, now, I know the idea of mortgages and down payments uh, can be scarier than a haunted house. Uh, but fear not, RBC is here uh, to turn your home ownership journey into comedy of success, uh, not a horror, horror show. Uh, you might be wondering what's the key to buying a home. Uh, well, it's not buried in a treasure chest guarded by dragons, uh, but it does involve a bit of budgeting and some strategic planning. At RBC, we're not just about numbers. Uh, uh, we are more about uh, making your home buying experience as smooth as a well-buttered slide. Uh, so whether you're navigating the maze of mortgage rates or decoding the language of real estate, RBC is your financial GPS, uh, guiding you to the treasure trove of home ownership. Now let's address the big elephant in the room, the down payment. It's not a secret handshake or uh, it's not a secret, I'm sorry, it's not a secret handshake or a mysterious ritual. It's just the upfront investment to unlock the doors of your dream home. And yes, uh, you can put more pocket lint uh, in your piggy bank. Uh, in a world where financial landscapes are constantly evolving, utilizing investment opportunity, opportunities can accelerate your path to property ownership instead of letting uh, your savings sit idly. Consider using an investment account as a powerful tool to grow your down payment. Now let's compare different ways you can invest and grow your money for a down payment. Can you uh, please turn to the next slide? All right, so there you go. So today we are gonna discuss about TFSA, RRSP, and FHSA. Let's talk about TFSA first. It stands for Tax-Free Savings Account. It's usually for general savings. So let's say you're saving for uh, a vacation, you're saving for rainy days. Uh, RRSP is more for retirement savings. What I mean by that is you put your money in RRSP account and you save it for your retirement. FHSA is solely for first home purchase savings. Now who can open these accounts? TFSA, any Canadian resident with a social insurance number and who is having age of majority in the province. Uh, same with RRSP, but client needs to be under the age of 71. FHSA, Canadian resident with a social insurance number, age of majority, but should not be older than 71. Uh, and uh, it needs to be first time home buyer. Tax deductible contributions. All right, let me give you an example. Let's say your annual income is $100,000. And if you are investing, let's say, approximately $6,000 in one of these accounts, uh, for TFSA, your income tax will be calculated on the uh, $100,000 on your own, uh, whole annual income. However, in RSP and TFSA, it's tax deductible. What I mean by that is whatever amount of money you are putting in these accounts, uh, it's going to be minus uh, your annual income, minus your contribution in these accounts. So if it's $6,000, it's going to be your annual taxable income is going to be $94,000. So yeah, that's quite a good feature of, of RSP and FHSA. Tax-free withdrawals. In TFSA, you can withdraw as much amount without paying any taxes. In RSP, you can also withdraw, uh, in RSP, you can withdraw the amount if you are purchasing the house for the first time. If not, you will have to pay the marginal tax rate on the withdrawals. In FHSA, since it's only for first home purchase savings, you do not pay any taxes on the withdrawal. Now, what is the maximum contribution limit for TFSA? Uh, it's 6,500 for 2023. Uh, if in 2029, a person is a Canadian resident and having age of majority, so the total contribution room available from 2009 till 23 is going to be $88,000. In 2024, they made changes to that. Now you can annually contribute uh, $7,000 in your TFSA account. Uh, for RRSP, it's going to be 18% of the previous year income. So maximum contribution you can put in a year is going to be $30,780 for 2023. For FHSA, it's $8,000 per year and it's accumulated year by year with the maximum lifetime contribution of being $40,000. Uh, that's all about TFSA, RSP, and the FHSA. If you turn over to the next slide, I will have my friend Chris take over and discuss about mortgages. And if you do have any questions, I would be more than happy to assist you one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, number one, thanks so much, uh, Norton, for having me here. That's really kind of you to invite me on year two. So it means year one was pretty good. Um, all right, so when it comes to mortgages, you guys, I'm a mortgage broker. A mortgage broker, to be clear, 
uh, does not work at the bank. So we typically are independents. We might be part of a large company, but we are essentially self-employed. And so our job really uh, is to understand your financial picture. It's to share mortgage knowledge with you and figure out what you qualify for and also figure out what the very best mortgage rates are uh, that are available to you based on your specific financial profile. So to be clear, that means that we do business with over 50 different lenders. That means there's some banks. Names that you might be familiar with are like TD, Scotia, and others. There's credit unions. So in the Ottawa region, you might be familiar with Meridian Credit Union or Desjardins and so on. And then there's mortgage companies. Mortgage companies are typically names that people are a little bit less familiar with. Those include names like CMLS Financial, MCAP, Strive Capital, and, and so on. Each institution has their own uh, advantages and disadvantage. They all have their own little nuances, their own little quirks. And so it really is a, is a, a joy for us, honestly, to, to sometimes put the puzzle together because there are instances where the file might work at one institution and not the other. And really our job is to figure out why it would work somewhere and, and how can we truly get this person approved. Um, specific to different scenarios that exist within the, within the marketplace, I've already gone through some of the different institutions that might exist, but it's important to understand that not every mortgage contract is the same. And so uh, there's different kinds of products. I think that's the obvious one. So there's typically a fixed rate mortgage or a variable rate mortgage. So fixed rate means that you're guaranteed a certain interest rate for a certain period of time. That contract can be as long as 10 years or as short as one year. And most commonly you'll see contracts are somewhere between three to five years in the fixed rate space. So because the interest rate is guaranteed, it means that your payments will also be guaranteed for the duration of that contract. On the flip side, if you look at variable rate mortgages, you're going to see that the interest rate can go up, it can go down, there's no limit as to how high it can go, no limit as to how low it can go. And within the variable rate world, there's, there's actually two types of, of variable rate products. So certain institutions have a product where the payment will go up and down at the same time as the rate going up and down. And other institutions will have a payment that remains the same. So we call that a static payment. So the payment remains the same even though the rate is going up or down. So there's many nuances within these types of programs or products and not, there, there isn't one option that's necessarily universally better. Um, I'd also mention that beyond cash flow and beyond the economics around fixed versus variable, there's often one feature that's not really talked about, and that's what happens if you need to break your mortgage contract. So if ever you, let's say, take a five-year fix and you break your mortgage contract, meaning you sell the house early, or you're blessed and you win the lottery and you can pay off your mortgage early, uh, there are penalties that come along with breaking these contracts. And so on the fixed rate side of things, um, the penalty can fluctuate. It's either three months of interest or a formula called an interest rate differential. I would say that's code for the penalty will be somewhere in the range of one to 4% of the loan amount. So they can be pretty hefty. Uh, and on the flip side, when we look at the variable rates, the, the strong advantage the variable rate will have uh, is that the penalty cost is the smallest possible. So it's three months of interest. And so a lot of times you're going to see people that if, if, they're, if they're into home flips or into refinancing and restructuring their mortgages to build a real estate portfolio, a lot of these borrowers will tend to go on the variable rate side of things because they're more likely to break their mortgage contract. And then when it comes to uh, choosing the right institution and, and why uh, some people go directly to one institution and, and why some people use brokers, ultimately it's about choice. You know, if, if you'd like to go direct with one institution because that's what you feel comfortable with, by all means, power to you. Uh, and, and if someone wants a bit of choice and, and working with a, a mortgage broker, I'd say that that's what a lot of the, um, probably the, um, a bigger piece of the younger generation is doing now. Uh, we can all Google rates, we can all see what all the rates are, but it's about understanding the little nuances. It's about understanding the fine print about the mortgage penalty, or can I pay my mortgage a little faster, such as prepayment privileges? Or uh, does this contract have a large penalty, a big penalty? Does it have uh, the ability to skip a payment if I'm having a hard time one month or one year? So there's a lot of little nuances that we might talk about if you're working with a broker. And I think a lot of those things are also talked about within the bank. It's just a matter, that, a matter of the fact that 
um, we'll, we can go through the, the multiple nuances all in one conversation. So what's the process of working with a mortgage broker? The first thing is we have to have a preliminary phone call. So typically Norton will uh, send a name and number my way and we'll uh, communicate with the uh, borrower for the very first time. And it's mostly just about sharing what I'm all about and figuring out what the borrower wants to do. And once we're off, off that call, we've either built a preliminary application on the phone or we send an application, an online application uh, to the borrower. The application that we use is a smart portal. So if you say I'm a salaried employee, well, the portal will automatically ask you for the right documentation. So we, we have some uh, s smart technology that we use to help borrowers. And then once borrowers have uploaded, uploaded their proof of income, maybe identification, if they already own real estate, we might have to collect other documentation such as a mortgage statement and property tax bill. Um, we are then in a position where we can confirm whether someone is pre-approved, which means we can now tell someone your maximum purchase price is a certain amount. But just because we're saying your maximum purchase price is 500000 for example, doesn't mean you should do it. We have to have a budgeting conversation. We have to make sure that you're feeling comfortable. We have to make sure that we get you out home hunting for the home that's right for you. And so assuming we get you out home hunting at the right price point, you will then go shopping with Norton uh, or some of his colleagues. And, uh, and ultimately, if and when you buy a home, you now have to come back to me and we go through a bunch of mortgage options and you will pick the one that is best suited for you. So at that time, we'd have like an hour long conversation by phone or video or in person, whatever is best for you. And in that conversation, we are essentially going over the bank, credit union, mortgage company, rate, term, product, all of these options. And you're gonna pick the option that's best for you. Once I get to say you're approved, it's possible that the financial institution that's approved the file has a few additional questions. Maybe they want a more up-to-date pay stub or perhaps they've got, uh, they want to phone your employer to make sure that uh, your letter of employment is authentic. So just because you're approved doesn't mean that you're quite at the finish line yet. There typically are a few straggling conditions that we have to satisfy over the next few days. And once we've satisfied mortgage conditions, we're now at a point where the mortgage lender or the bank or the credit union will then send mortgage instructions to the lawyer or the solicitor. And that essentially means that your file is complete with me and at that point, you are now moving on to the next step. Now, before I pass on the mic, I think it's important to talk about how do we even pick the right mortgage broker or the right banker, or who do we really want to work with? Um, I find in, in an age where um, there's endless information online, sometimes it's a little bit daunting to figure out what's truly better, and sometimes it all looks a little bit the same. So I, I urge first-time homebuyers, second-time homebuyers, people who want to refinance to really look at uh, Google reviews. That's a, a great hint as to whether the mortgage professional is knowledgeable or offers good communication. There's also a bunch of other awards where, that the person might have. So they might, have, uh, they might be on the three best rated or have a BBB recognition. There's many uh, different types of ways that you can assess whether the broker or the banker uh, knows what they're talking about. And I'd say also listen to family, listen to friends. People have worked with mortgage professionals, lawyers, realtors. They, they typically are happy to send you to someone who helped them. Um, and lastly, I guess I just comment that if you're really looking for the right person, it's good to ask them questions. What will the turnaround time be? What can my expectation be in terms of process? And um, will, will, will this take a long time? Will it... Uh, are you available after hours? Oftentimes, I, I pick up a lot of clientele because I'm available to work in the evenings or on the weekends. So these are all questions that you should ask. And I think they sound so basic as I'm saying them here. But in the moment, I find oftentimes customers or potential customers forget to ask these questions. And I'm try, I, I try very much to share some of those basics. So I think that's it for me for now. Norton, uh, it's your turn, my friend. Uh, so thanks so much for taking the time, guys. Like I said, uh, a big portion of what we're trying to mimic here is really, uh, like we had the financial advisor first, it's really trying to mimic uh, the process of kind of what uh, a home, pur home purchase would look like. So in terms of the stages and the professionals that we'll be uh, encountering throughout a purchase, that's really what we're trying to imitate here. Um, I want to slip to the next slide here, so this one right here. The home, the home buying process does not have to be as daunting a task when executed properly. So what does that mean? Uh, I really resonate with this one in terms of having helped a lot of first-time home buyers, whether that's you know somebody fresh out of university or professionals that are uh, you know well-established in their career. 
it's a daunting process, right? In terms of there's all these questions that uh, even Chris has raised in terms of what uh, the process can look like from beginning to end. So I really resonate in the sense that there's a method to everything and truly uh, when it's executed properly, it doesn't have to be as daunting. This is, at the end of the day, this is an exciting chapter of your life and a really uh, monumental step in, in kind of setting the stage, right? So if you really think about it, um, a big point of, and Chris actually touched on it very well, is that uh, we always tell our clients that we live in a world that's extremely Googleable. What do I mean by that? In the sense that with a click of a button, it'll say a lot about one in terms of Google reviews, but more in terms of the reputation uh, of what other people that have worked with this professional, what that says about them. And I uh, truly believe that that does set the stage uh, for what your potential experience could, could look like. So if we go on the next slide there. Preparing to buy. So uh, we kind of outline them in terms of the, the four W's that we have here, right? So in terms of when are you moving? So in terms of uh, when we come across, whether it's first time home buyers or established home buyers, right? The process oftentimes comes down to when. So is this months away? Is this you know a quarter away? Is this half a year or a year away? It could be in terms of people that in this room as well. It could be two years down the road. If you guys noticed, one of the last questions was, when were you looking to potentially buy in your ideal scenario, right? So why are we asking that is that it's really, it takes a lot of planning in terms of we've had clients that say, we're looking to move within the next three weeks, uh, you know, kickstart the process, or is that really uh, when that looks like uh, putting the right dominoes in place? It could be six months down the road, but we really do want to set a framework for what the expectations would look like. Um, in terms of whether you're in a current lease, we have people that are currently renting, they already have commitments, or you could be at home. You could be at home and you know what, there's, if we, look, if we think about it from a timeline point of view, living at home that creates and sets the stage for a very um, more, the stage is set a lot more in the sense that you don't have leases or commitments that you could be tied to that could uh, impact the rest of the transaction as well. Um, oftentimes that, you know, where? You always hear the, you always hear the term location, 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 but um, it's really important I find that in our, in our experience dealing with first time home buyers in the sense that location, you might cast your net you know, across Canada, across Stittsville, it could be the west end of the city, but as you really uh, mature throughout your home buying process, it's really important to really narrow down and focus on what we call your ideal scenario, right? If you had it your way, where would you be in the city? And in the sense that if you're casting a wide net throughout your home buying journey, it could be, you know, we've had clients that have purchased in three weeks, you know, literally within the first few homes they've seen, or it could be, we've had clients that took them over a year to purchase. No right or wrong answer, but, it could, if you really think about it, stem to, are they casting a net too wide? Is it across the city and you don't really know what your true ideal scenario would look like, right? Um, in terms of uh, what are your non-negotiables? So we often talk, talk with our clients in terms of what are your, you know, your core fundamentals, but are there truly some aspects of your home purchase that you would consider a non-negotiable, right? Is there aspects of a true backyard that's, you know, back onto green space or there's no rear neighbors? Is it, uh, there's elements that you might consider as true core fundamentals that you won't settle on. And then again, a lot of the, a lot of the attendees in this room are for potential first-time homebuyers. As first-time homebuyers, there might be a list of needs, wants, non-negotiables, but of those, you might have to compromise on a few, but you might stick to your core fundamentals that are non-negotiable uh, from that. In terms of decision makers, you know, we have a few parents in the room. Who are the decision makers in the process, right? In terms of both financially, or we talk with our clients in terms of decision makers in the sense that are you consulting, again, there's no right or wrong answer, but are you consulting your friends throughout this process, right? Are you getting their input? I've had many clients that come across where they're not, you know, it's a private home search. It's they're not telling anybody in the sense that this is a big chapter. They don't want other people to know. Or if you have clients that it's, you know, they're telling, they're, they're showing every single listing to their friends of what do you think of this, right? But what, why I touch on that is the sense that We've had uh, you know, varying degrees of experiences in the sense that uh, it can shape what, you know, you fall in love with this house and your friend says, eh, you know, it's not that great of a home, right? That can, that can throw off the process, right? In the sense of it's such an emotional process that you want to narrow in on who's involved uh, in the process. In, in the sense that nobody likes surprises, why do we want to be an educated home buyer? Uh, you know, at the end of this presentation, you guys are all going to get a copy. Uh, of our updated uh, buyer guide that we, we had a graphic designer do. That's a really big um, process in terms of understanding and being a true educated home buyer on market dynamics and truly narrowing in on uh, what the, not only the steps in the process entail, but uh, the nuances as well. Understanding the finances. So what we're talking about, you know, Chris and, and Ron really touched on that, but really at the end of the day, we said nobody likes, you know, surprises, but also in the sense of being well-versed financially, 
you know, we always go back to that expression. Somebody gives you a dollar doesn't mean you necessarily spend a dollar as well, right? So being budgeting and being cognizant of kind of what, you know, in a, whether it's a micro or macro home, this is a large financial purchase that you want to be budgeting for short and long term. Uh, and, and in the sense that not being, uh, or sorry, understanding finances, we definitely do want to be well versed in terms of uh, John, who's going to be touching on inspections. What are the costs at play? Uh, often, you know, these are all cash, uh, cash on closing, we call it. So land transfer tax, inspection, legal fees. These are elements that we never want to be in a transaction where you said, Norton, you didn't tell me that. You didn't tell me that. That's a surprise. We don't want that. And we want to be well versed where professionals in the room here uh, are definitely going to be reminding you throughout the process as well. So touch on the next slide. Work with an agent. Uh, we often call it, they're your quarterback throughout the transaction, right? Uh, there's so many emotions at play. There's so many different variables at play. Um, but being your trusted source and really putting the chess pieces at play, if you will, uh, throughout the process. So working uh, with the multiple listing surface, uh, service, sorry, that references uh, the resale market. So homes that you'll see, realtor.ca, you'll see them online. Or, you know, there's access that we have, you know, whether you're a first-time home buyer at um, the 500,000 price point up to, you know, call it 800,000, what your budget, it doesn't matter. There's options out there, whether it's in the resale market uh, or in the new construction space. So, you know, you'll have some people that reside in Barhaven in the room here. You'll notice that lots of ongoing development in like Half Moon Bay, for example, uh, Minto, Urbandale. These are familiar names that you'll hear uh, that are active, for example, in the uh, new construction space. But, you know, once those are occupied by potential home buyers, those trickle into the resale market. But as a potential buyer, you'd want to know kind of what opportunities exist, both uh, new and uh, new and in the resale market. Jump in the next one there. So in terms of house hunting, so what does the process actually look like? You know, at this point, you've likely consulted a financial professional and know what the, uh, the framework looks like on the, on the finances. And you're really, ultimately, this is the fun part. At the end of the day, this is when you're visiting homes, you're actively uh, shortlisting and really understanding kind of what, uh, what you're truly looking for. Uh, viewing homes, I, emph I emphasize this all the time. At the end of the day, your professional, like you're a real estate agent, they're not a professional door opener. What do I mean by that? In the sense that if their value add is solely opening the door, that's a kitchen, like, no kidding, that's a kitchen, right? Like you want to know really in the sense of uh, they're your advisor and they're your extra set of eyes. That should be truly uh, beyond the specs of the home identifying. Is this in a big open field in Canada where it's, it's isolated? Is what's being built behind there? You want to know the nuances beyond just the specs of the home, uh, the due diligence uh, on top of that of kind of what future uh, ramifications could be. You know, we had a client, for example, a couple weeks ago, they were looking at a big estate home. There is a big open field. So today it's a no rear neighbor home, but in five years from now, it's owned by the garbage dump at the city of Ottawa. So I wouldn't want to be backing onto that. These are little examples of kind of uh, extra due diligence that I emphasize that uh, they're there to protect you at the end of the day. Oh, go back one second. In terms of open houses, uh, I always uh, outline to people, whether you're early in the process or you're, um, you know what, you're well into your home buying journey, I always emphasize that ho uh, open houses are a great tool uh, in terms of understanding your landscape, you know, your location that we're talking about, uh, and really narrowing in on whether you're early or in the process, it's a good tool in terms of availability, as well as uh, in, for example, a lot of suburban neighborhoods, you'll notice that uh, floor plans are a big thing. You're buying off floor plan if you're buying new construction, but if you're visiting these open houses, it can give you an opportunity uh, to really identify and familiarize yourself uh, with these as well. On the right side here, I'm not sure how well you guys are able to see this. This will be sent off to you nevertheless, uh, but we create a flow chart in the sense of uh, understanding the dynamics of where we're relating searching and viewing and offering to the possible outcomes that could come from that. So if you see on the right side there, you'll notice you know, the element of, you know, you finally found that home. What does that look like? And the possible uh, variables at play in terms of accepting, rejecting, countering your offer, what that looks like and the potential um, the potential third party factors like conditional, is it conditional, is it unconditional? And then the various factors such as financing, inspection that we're gonna be talking about as well. But uh, this will be sent off to you. It's not too clear here on the screen, uh, but again, it'll be sent off to you and really understanding uh, the process from start to finish. So uh, next, next up in line here, we have John, who's gonna be uh, talking a little bit about home inspections and kind of what uh, to expect and how that would uh, work as well. Good evening, thank you all for coming over this evening. Um, I hope you don't mind if I have a bit of lunch while I talk to you. Is that okay? Before I start talking about home inspections or home inspectors, I'd like to read something to you, okay? Which is a little off key here, but bear with me, okay? By the way, there's dyslexia involved here too, okay? So just be careful. 
Keep out of reach of children and pets. May irritate eyes, may cause an allergic reaction. Avoid contact with eyes and skin. Do not ingest. First aid treatment. If in eyes, rinse with water. Remove contact lenses. Continue to rinse eyes for at least 15 minutes. Wash hands after handling. If reaction develops, discontinue. Use, get medical attention. If swallowed, do not induce vomiting. Call a physician or poison center immediately. Do not use in small or confined pet areas without ventilation. In the UK, Public Health Center for Radiation, Chemicals and Environmental Hazards has revealed that it is, typically contains another toxic compound that absolutely is formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is well-known human carcinogens that has been definitely linked to cancer of the nose and throat. It is also known to cause ongoing irritation of the throat and airways, potentially leading to dangerous infections in frequent nosebleeds, asthma, and other respiratory ailments. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Take a guess. Anybody? Raise your hand. Come on. Somebody. Go for it. Anybody else? Take a guess. Come on. Nobody? Okay. Let, let me show you what I'm talking about. This. All right. All of the Scandinavian countries have banned this. There is a known cancer-causing agent in it. Okay. The best smell in the house is no smell in the house. And a lot of agents will tell you that when they list your house. Don't put all these perfume things in here. It's not good. If I go into a house and there's this, I unplug them before I start to work. I don't want to inhale it. It's like secondhand smoke. Yes? Okay, what about like, like sage infusers and stuff like that? Just do some research. Make sure there's no chemicals in it. Okay. Okay? Same thing. So, unless it's a good apple pie, that's good in the house, but not this. Okay? <laughs> Home inspectors. Ten inspectors, ten opinions. Guaranteed, 10 opinions, all right? There's no two inspectors that work the same. Nine of them are always wrong. I'm always right. Just, just kidding. <laughs> when you're looking for an inspector, please talk to your agent. The agent will never refer just any inspector to you because he wants to make his client happy because agents are selfish because if they don't make you happy, you won't buy another house from them down the road or you won't recommend them, right? Ask your inspector, are you certified? Do you have insurance? There is no certification in Ontario. There's no licensing in Ontario. There's no mandatory insurance in Ontario. Just BC and Alberta. It's terrible. Anybody can go get a business card made. Hey, I'm a home inspector. Please do your research before you hire somebody. And again, if your agent recommends someone, take that agent or that inspector, all right? Make sure they know what they're doing, going in and out, look for referrals, go on their website. And if they've only been doing it for six months, don't hire them, please. Okay. <laughs> All right, please don't do that. Ask, ask a lot of questions. If they know somebody, if you know somebody that used an, an inspector, they should go from top to bottom, from attic down to the basement, exterior, roof, you name it, they have to inspect it. We don't inspect fences, we don't inspect appliances, right? It's not part of the house, it's just a, a unit inside the house. Electrical, plumbing, foundation, windows, doors, heating, cooling. We inspect all those things. But we do not go into a house and start turning on ovens. We used to. And the last time I did that was 10 years ago, high rise, turned on the washing machine for the laundry, and it wouldn't stop filling up. I had to rush in the back and shut everything down because it was going to overflow. So these things do happen, all right? Uh, again, please ask, do your, do your due diligence. And I'm not a long speaker, but that's me. <laughs> what? Where's my picture? Come on. <laughs> Don't you have a picture on there? <laughs> Anyways, please uh, just listen to your agent. All right? Thank you. Uh, sorry, yes? Uh, if home inspectors in Ontario don't have licenses. No, just on Alberta and B.C. Because they've worked with them in the past, right? And they're not going to recommend somebody that does a half-assed job, excuse the expression, right? Because they know right away if they're a good ins inspector or not. 
right? And Norton's been around for a while. But I've been around longer than Norton. <laughs> you can tell just by looking at me. All right, but just do your due diligence. All right? Thank you. All right, so John just walked us through. Oh, there we go. There you go. So John just walked us through due diligence on the physical aspect of a home. That's the home inspection. He said you go from the roof down to the basement and everything in between. Lawyers, we've got two rules. Most people don't even know that they need a lawyer, right? Really? Like, so what we do as lawyers is one, we wanna make sure that we're taking care of title and of your mortgage. All right, so when I'm talking about title, I'm talking, to, it's the equivalent of what John's looking at, but from a legal aspect. I wanna make sure you're not buying, you're not inheriting any issues from the seller, liens, encumbrances, anything that would affect your valid ownership of title. On top of that, on closing, your lawyer's job is to transfer title from the seller's name to your name as purchaser, and only lawyers can do that in the line of registry office. In Ontario, you'll see that Latin phrase down there, caveat emptor. What, what that means is that it's the buyer's responsibility in Ontario to satisfy themselves that they're making a valid purchase. All right, you're not relying on the seller to tell you if there's something wrong with the house. That's why you got John in your corner. That's why you got a whole team in your corner to back you up and help you figure out whether or not this is the right fit for you. Um, lawyers were the last people in line. Obviously, we're privy to some information that is not available to others. So we do make sure that all of that's been done by the time you close. The second portion of a lawyer's mandatory role is the administration of the mortgage. And so Chris went over residential lenders, whether you're going with a bank, with a lending company, with a uh, credit union, those entities will always retain your lawyer as their lawyer as well. This is what we refer to as the joint retainer. And so you need to understand that your lawyer is acting for both yourself as a borrower, but also for the lender to administer that mortgage. Right, so no information can be kept confidential when a lawyer is acting for two people. So that, that is very important to understand. Um, lenders will not fund your money until you've fulfilled your conditions and your lawyer is there to make sure that those conditions are fulfilled. Other than the legal aspect, a lawyer's job is also to just make the whole process smooth. Um, you're dealing with a lot of different people asking you for a lot of different items. You're starting with a mortgage broker, you're dealing with a, with a realtor, home inspector, maybe with a banker as well if you've got that FHSA going. Us as lawyers at the very end, we just wanna bring the puzzle pieces together and make sense out of the whole thing. So that is from a practical standpoint, the role of a lawyer. So we're talking about home insurance, utilities, making sure you're set up for property taxes, water and sewer bill, hydro gas, signed up for condo fees, and that you do have the funds that um, you need to close ready to go on closing. One of, the f one of the biggest questions I get is, when am I gonna get my keys and what is land transfer tax? So let me just tackle one of those here with land transfer tax. Land transfer tax is a tax levied by the Ministry of Finance on every purchase of land in Ontario. All right, it's an admin fee. Let's call it what it is. Now, first time home buyers often ask me, well, I heard that I don't need to pay that. Is that true? The short answer is it depends. And so first time home buyers do qualify for an exemption. All right, there's, there's a few conditions that need, they need to fulfill, but th they need to also understand that that exemption is capped at $4,000. So, you know, way back in the day when I bought my first property, um, the first time home buyer exemption would cover the entirety of my land transfer tax. But recently with the recent markets, the increase in purchase prices, you need also need to budget for that because you're no longer covering necessarily that full portion. Okay, so that there is a budgeting aspect to land transfer tax right off the bat. And then also finding a professional that can advise you on whether or not you will qualify for that exemption. Here I'm, I'm talking, you, obviously you need to be at least 18 years old, you need to be a citizen or permanent resident. It must be for personal occupancy, and you cannot have owned an eligible home, you or your spouse, anywhere in the world. So, cool. 
So uh, I think an interesting exercise in terms of beyond just the stuff we've purchased is really to kind of go into a bit of detail of kind of what we're seeing in the market. So again, in terms of relevant day-to-day uh, -day knowledge, uh, I think a key component of understanding uh, the dynamics in 2023 or even dating back 2021, you know, uh, post COVID into today, uh, market dynamics have certainly shifted lots in terms of activity, in terms of purchases, uh, in terms of if we bring it to the financial side, uh, you know, from when I first started speaking with Chris to today, totally different in terms of, you know, the, the timeline of getting back, the inquiries that they're fielding, as well as from us in terms of the uh, actual drafting of, of offers when we first uh, first started post COVID, we're seeing a lot more of uh, no conditions and then uh, in terms of the purchase, right? And then as we transitioned into uh, later 22 into 23, market dynamics shifted a lot and then we saw a lot more conditions come back into the market. Uh, so I think an interesting exercise will be to really uh, dive into kind of from the mortgage side, from the legal side uh, and from my side, kind of what we're seeing in the market. So. Uh, perhaps we'll start with the mortgage side in terms of kind of uh, intake volume, day-to-day. Uh, -day. Chris, what are you kind of seeing in the market uh, from the mortgage side, uh, perhaps dating back to late last year and then into this year? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. It caught me off guard. No, it's so all good. Let me think about this one here. But essentially what we're seeing the, in the marketplace is we have a lot of um, potential borrowers that are phoning or reaching reaching out over email. So there's a lot of excitement, a lot of eagerness to get into the market. Interest rates have been higher than, you know, uh, they've been at its peak. Uh, when you look at the last 15 years, uh, the last year was the highest rates that we've seen in about 15 years. And so those increased rates have made it challenging for a lot of buyers, uh, young or older, uh, and especially the first time home buyer dynamic. And so, a little bit of what I was saying last year, actually, when I was here, was that um, for a lot of these first-time home buyers, we're seeing co-signers, we're seeing uh, parents essentially uh, guaranteeing the mortgage loan because we need a bit more income on the file to get it to qualify. Um, that that's pretty. Uh, I don't want to say it's on every file, but it's very common. The other thing that we're seeing is uh, a lot of families are looking at giving an early inheritance to. Uh, to the kids or, or, or grandchildren because um, the reality is that in a lot of cases it's, it's hard to save and hard to save enough for, for an adequate down payment today. So these are two, two things that we've seen a lot over the last, let's, let's call it, it's been increasing over the last five years, but especially in the last like 12 to 24 months. And then from an interest rate perspective, I mean, I'd, I'd love to sit here and tell you what's going to happen with rates, but I, I don't know any better than all the economists that keep getting it wrong. So uh, rates have been high. Uh, we all expect rates to improve over the next year or two. However, if, if the real estate market gets hot and we see a lot of action, it's going to be very hard for rates to go down. And so it's going to be an interesting dynamic to see what happens over the next six months as we expect the, the Bank of Canada to try to lower rates. Of drop the rate by a quarter percent. See what happens. If the real estate market goes on fire, they're probably going to pause for a little bit. If nothing happens, then, then they might be adventurous in lowering the rate a little bit more. Now, to be clear, when we see everything in the media about these, this is getting a long-winded answer all of a sudden here, but when we, when we see these, these announcements in the news saying the Bank of Canada is lowering rates or, or keeping rates the same, really that only impacts variable rates. And I'm saying that specifically because fixed rates actually have been coming down over the last 60 to 90 days. Rates today are better than they were before Christmas. And uh, there's maybe been a little bit of a bump this week where they, they haven't kept going down, but that's because the Bank of Canada made an announcement and so everyone kind of paused. I think we're going to continue seeing slight drops in rates on the fixed side of things, uh, but it's gonna be a bit of a wild card. Is that cool. what you were hoping no, for, my friend? Good. No, that's good, man. Yeah. <laughs> Can you repeat the question? Yeah, I was just, I was just, just yeah. Um, yeah, legal side is completely different. Um, we we spoke about due diligence, conducting due diligence um, on on the physical aspect of the house with the home inspector, and then also with a lawyer when you're searching title. 
Uh, and so my answer is going to relate specifically to fulfilling conditions um, on the physical aspect of the home. And, and so this is something that I do inherit when I receive an agreement of purchase and sale. Um, over the last couple of years, I would receive them with no conditions. So that means, you know, no due diligence on the physical <coughs> aspects of the home, no inspection. Um, maybe no pre-approval with a lender. It's essentially a shot in the dark, cross your fingers and hope it works out. And I do have seen quite a bit of buyers having like defaulted on their contracts and, and needing a litigator to get through it and you know, and, and having to go through uh, court proceedings to, to resolve that. <clears throat> so it is refreshing for me to see conditions again. Um, so make the best of it, absolutely. Like, the standard conditions you can expect for a condo would be the status certificate review. Um, and something that we see across the board is obviously for financing and for inspection. And so um, it is reassuring. I think it's a more balanced market. I think it's, it's best for, it's a really good time for buyers right now, obviously setting aside everything else. Cool. And then just from the real estate side, like to give you guys a little bit of insight in terms of last, uh, you know, last calendar year of 2023, for the entire year, we saw 92% of our purchases were owner-occupied homes. So uh, of that percentile, I would say more than, more than about 85% of those percentage, uh, sorry, of that percentage was uh, true first-time home buyers. So it gives you a perspective of kind of what the numbers look like in terms of the investor market. So when, like when I first met these two guys, you know, Chris and Alex, the, the investor pool was very much still active in, in the auto market. In today's market, if you look at uh, townhomes, the numbers, if you really crunch the numbers with Chris, it's tough. It's tough to make, you know, a townhouse that you're purchasing north of $600,000, you're putting, say, 20% down with your monthly rental, like, you know, in terms of, say, your suburban townhomes, uh, townhouse, renting in that range of 24 to 26, call it, the numbers simply just don't really make a lot of sense if, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, yeah, right. like in terms of uh, the dynamics of when we were really in a very active market in 2020, 21, 22, early parts of 22, you, you guys potentially in the room as first time home buyers were very much competing with that investor from Ottawa, from Toronto. That was also in that offer count, that number count. Uh, that made the dynamics a lot more tricky, a lot more difficult. Um, so it's very important to understand and then give you guys a little bit of real time data of last year, what we saw, majority being first time home buyers that truly owner occupied the home. Uh, and today uh, can give you guys a little bit of insight in terms of you know months of inventory. So months of inventory being how much inventory in the city of Ottawa would we need until this inventory sells out? So currently we're, we're hovering just north of three months of inventory, whereas in the hot months of 2021, 22, we're looking at like 0.9, 1.1, 1.2 months of inventory being, make it, making it a very tight market in terms of, you know, in the whole district of Barhaven, including all the sub-districts, you might be looking at within that time frame, a handful of townhomes that are active. There's only so many options out there in terms of where that same townhouse is getting 30 viewings as opposed to in today, there might be five in the same district, right? So that really opens up the doors in terms of uh, competing and really seeing kind of what uh, that, it, it'll be interesting to see this year if that investor pool comes back to the market, despite with today's rates, you know, we've crunched some numbers for recent investors, they still, they still don't pencil very much. So it's, it, it allows an opportunity for a lot of prospective first time home buyers to really see uh, an opportunity to not be competing and potentially uh, put in uh, those conditions that we weren't seeing early in 21 and first part of 22. Uh, so we'll open up the floor. Is there any questions uh, for anybody uh, in terms of whether it be on the presentation side or? I'd like to go first if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah, 100%. Any questions for a home inspector? How do you get paid? Pardon me? How do you get paid? How do you get paid? Gold. <laughs> Either you transfer or cash. I don't take credit cards. No, but I mean, it's just on a service basis. You get called to inspect a home and then you get paid. Correct, yes. Okay. The average is 550 to 800 bucks, depending on the house. Okay. Size of the home. So yeah. saying really it's 800 No, it's a, there's some that are 550. It depends on the size. If it's a two bedroom bungalow, it's important to get inspections, right? During COVID, a lot of people did not get inspections. There was a particular house in Orleans, a townhouse, 18 people bid over this house, 18 people. They went 135 grand over asking, no inspections. The people took over the house, they called me up to do inspections. And I told them, I said, it doesn't matter what I find, it's your problem. 
And in all the years I've been doing this, I've never seen this in my life. I opened up the attic hatch. Does anybody know what an attic hatch looks like? Inside, it's like your head in there, okay. The rafters were literally falling. I've never seen that. Instead of three or four nails, there was one. And they weren't lined up, they were on the sides like this, instead of like this. And it was collapsing. And it cost them not only the 135 they were paid, but another $75,000 to fix it. Wow. 75 grand. Inspect your house before yeah. you buy it. Okay. Does anybody have questions? Anything? Yes. I thought, was this your preview home inspection experience? Do you have another one? I have all kinds of them. <laughs> Give my story, John. Give yeah, my story. <laughs> there's all kinds. There's just, if, you, if you guys are selling a home, make sure it's prepared for viewing. Put things away. Right? There's things that I don't want to see. And there's things. <laughs> just yes. put them away. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, I've seen foundations crack and split. Horizontal and vertical cracks. Horizontal are the worst. Because if you have a horizontal crack, this is the basement outside. The earth will push it in like this. And it can push everything inside. Yes? I've got a couple for Chris. Um, so what before, before you do that, sorry for it, but let's finish with the... With yeah, we'll go, we'll, go, we'll go speaker yeah, by speaker. We'll go, we'll go, yeah, we'll go, we'll go speaker by speaker. You only cover the physical property itself. Like, say there was like a backyard and somebody was curious about like the soil. Like, is nope. there any contamination? Uh, house or? inspector. Okay. House. So we don't inspect properties or anything like that. Okay. With that said, like you know, there's well inspectors, and for example, if you're yes. doing, if you're doing water tests, for example, there's separate inspectors that would do that. that would like do well inspectors. Like a a Greeley estate home, for example, on well, you'd have John as well as your water testing. Um, yeah. yeah. Yes. When people work with you, do they sign on for like a yearly contract for like multiple inspections or is it no. more like just like a No, one just a one-time deal. Okay. I call the client prior to the inspection. I explain to them the process and I meet them at the house that they're buying and I get them to sign before I start the inspection. Get authorizing me to do the inspection. Awesome. Any more questions for John? Yeah, go ahead. Um, if we are grateful enough to have you as our inspector, I understand there's probably a checklist you follow, but what is one thing that's overlooked often? That's a good question. In a home inspection that you should look out for? Um, sometimes when I go in a basement, one wall will have all kinds of box storage. Oh, why is that there? And there's none over there. So it's a visual inspection, non intrusive. I'm not allowed to displace furniture. I'm not allowed to put holes in walls. I'm not allowed to rip up floors. Home sellers have no sense of humor when I do that, when I put holes in their wall. It's a visual inspection. But I've been doing this long enough that if I see stuff, I have a pretty good idea that maybe they're hiding something. Right? Then I have tools to find out what's behind there. Like moisture and these yeah. kind of things. Yeah. 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 Right? Anybody in here that's in the construction business? Dante. Actually, many, many. Okay. <laughs> many. Do you guys have any questions? No? Come on, Adam, you definitely have a question. Yeah. What do you look at for electrical? So I, I have a, an adult tester. If it's open ground or negative or knob and tube, my report will just say have a licensed electrician look at it. A home inspector is like a family physician. You go see your family doctor for a physical. Your doctor will examine you and say, I got to send you to go see a specialist. Family doctor knows a lot about the anatomy, but they're not specialists. Home inspectors know a lot of the construction, but we're not specialists, right? Mind you, I've been doing this for enough years, I know a lot more than some specialists. But if I see something like that, a problem with the electrical, that'll be my report. Hire a licensed ESA contractor to make sure there's nothing wrong with it. I assume more workers that you guys have contacts for all that are electric. Like electricians and the well inspectors, is that always required when you look at uh, If you're looking at, like, for example, like a, a home out in Mantec, oftentimes, like, it's on well, right? So you'd want to do the three uh, inspections that would come with it, yeah. Yeah. You got a question? Yeah. How can you tell if the foundation's cracking or uncovered? You said you had a moisture... Moisture meter. So it depends if the basement's finished or not. Right. It's, it's a cheap $35. I have an infrared camera that is $10,000. Okay. okay? But the moisture meter is just as accurate as the infrared camera. It has two little prongs. I poke the wall with it, make two little holes that's the size of a needle. And 
the, it'll read if there's moisture back there or not. Yeah. Okay, so. And sometimes you can't see everything outside because of the snow that's like covering the foundation. More moisture than the wall. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So I'll, I'll test inside walls and outside walls. And typically an outside wall will have a little bit more. But I mean, if it's up here, well, then it could get concerned. If it's down here, it's normal. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes? Can you detect if a uh, home recession, like a very old home, has asbestos? Yes. I do not displace it. So sometimes I stick my head in the attic, and there'll be blow, freshly blow, blown in insulation. There's always a possibility there is asbestos under that. I will not displace that newly installed insulation. My report will say, have it checked by a specialist. When they started removing asbestos from homes I don't know, 20 years ago or something, they would charge twenty and $30,000. Now you can get somebody to do it for $6,000 because everybody got into the business. Okay. So, yes? To your point in combination, if someone asked, like, whatever the legal term was, like, it's the buyer's responsibility. But if yeah. I went up and you say to me, oh, listen, there's some new fluff there, and I went to the seller and I said, is there asbestos? Or would, would they be able to say no to me? And then we find out later there is. Like, is that, is that still up to, to me? So Sorry, trying on John's side, he would draw that to the buyer's attention yeah. Yeah. in his report. Okay. And then chronologically, then the realtors would have a discussion because there are new laws for disclosure yeah. of that kind of stuff. And then on my end, I got to get into disclosure obligations like did they, were they hiding a defect they knew about especially okay. a defect that's like dangerous and that renders a home in, yeah. in, inhabitable that's kind of a legal test but there is almost a hierarchy of protection for buyers in place as long as you do have the inspection okay. you have a decent realtor and a decent lawyer like you do, there are considerable protections like we can use this we can use the asbestos example like say after the inspection happens after the inspection happens, you know, we raise the element of, you know what, there's uh, something from the inspection report that raised a red flag. A good realtor would send an email, what does that look like? We have it in writing for when it comes down to the lawyer side of things and where, like you said, if they hid something or they didn't disclose, that'd be something that, you know, the lawyers would hash out as well. But on the realtor side, doing the due diligence off of that, for sure. You gotta remember too that the seller of a particular house that may or may not have asbestos that seller could be the third or the fifth mm -hmm. owner of that house. So they possibly could, don't right. know. Maybe they right. don't know, yeah. right? So that's always a possibility. Yeah. But you know, that's why you hire a home inspector. Awesome. Any more questions for John? And then we'll, we'll move on to Chris. Yes. Yeah. A quick one, out of curiosity, how long does like, a home inspection take you? Two and a half to three hours. A day thing, like in a, within a day? Yeah, so some inspectors will take an hour. Stay away from them, please. OK. okay. Some inspectors charge 250 bucks. I mentioned that to you. Stay away from them. Okay. Oh, I gotta save money. You're spending half a million dollars or a million dollars on a house, and some buyers don't want to spend 600 bucks to get a house inspected. You're protecting yourself and whoever's going to be living in there. Right. It's just very, very important. Right. Any other questions? Listen, I appreciate you guys asking these questions. I'm going to depart. But on my way out, I'm going to grab a sandwich and I'm going to keep on going. Thanks, John. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Thank, Thank you. you. Perfect. Uh, any other questions on the financial side for either Ron uh, or Chris? Uh, we'll, Dean? So you're a shareholder in a corporation that controls the corporation and the corporation owns real estate. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so there is, there's a planning act issue and there's also a land transfer tax issue there. For land transfer tax, because you have, because you're controlling that corporation, you have an interest in that property. So I would say that you're probably, you're, you're not gonna qualify for the land transfer tax exemption, but for the planning act, planning act is when you own two abutting lands and you don't, you don't want them to merge. Um, owning shares in a corporation is a good way of getting around that rule, where like if you want to own it personally with one name and with the corporation with like the abutting lands, you can do that as well. So 
Um, it depends on what you're, you're talking about. Like for just for line transfer tax, the corporation is not going to offer an advantage, but it does offer advantages elsewhere. Whether you're talking about tax wise, you're talking about signing access. Um, does that answer your question? Kind of. Yeah. I'll talk to you more later. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> Awesome. Any other questions on the financial side um, for Chris or, or Ron? Yeah, so I got a couple. Yeah. Uh, it's open floor. So Chris, yeah. first of all, um, financial presentation was pretty succinct. But what goes into a pre-approval in terms of, um, like, is it just based on your credit score? Is it based on your um, Is it based on other leverage that you have? Like, what, what are all the factors? Yeah. So the way to qualify for a mortgage ultimately is a calculation of income compared to debt obligations. So the way that I essentially describe it is your credit score is the barrier to entry. If your credit score is above, depending on the lender, 600, 620, 640, if it's above that number, then you get to play and there's a chance that you qualify. And then uh, the next step for us is to say, okay, well, based on this person's income and their payment obligations, how much do they qualify for from a loan? Uh, perspective what, what's the size of the loan really what we're looking at is what's the biggest payment that they could qualify for and then separately we have more of an affordability conversation uh, because just just because you qualify doesn't mean that you could necessarily truly afford it did I answer that, that question okay uh, I think I answered the first yeah. part only yeah so so credit score goes into it income versus debt yeah 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 but in general like like does does one pre-approval affect another pre-approval? Like, okay. what if you get a pre-approval and then the market changes, right. COVID happens or something like that? Right. Does that pre-approval affect your next pre-approval? Uh, so you can get multiple pre-approvals. I could do multiple pre-approvals and hold different rates with different lenders all at the same time, and that will not impact anything negatively. With that said, mortgage interest rates will impact what you qualify for. So you will qualify for more if the rate is 4%, you will qualify for less if the rate is 6%. And so what you qualify for today, today might be different than what you qualify for tomorrow. And so a pre-approval, when we say you qualify for $500,000, uh, the pre-approval will be valid for 120 days with most lenders. And that 120 day period means that you must take possession of the home within that period. So you have to sign a contract, buy in the house, and move into it all within that 120 day period for it to be, to be valid. Now, unless there's significant market changes that happen quickly, realistically, if you qualify today, you're probably going to qualify again for something relatively similar in 120 days. But we are in an environment right now where if rates do improve, there's a lot of clients that I, I would have said that don't qualify for what they want last year that, that might qualify for them this year. So that's why you're gonna hear people, or realtors like Norton, or mortgage brokers like myself, talk to uh, people and say, right now might be a good time to buy if someone can, because if rates go down, the market might get more flooded with potential buyers. Okay, so, but, like, let's just say that rates do go down, and your pre-approval is 120 days. It sounds like, don't get a pre-approval now, get a pre-approval three months from now with hopes that the rates go down and maybe get approved for some more, right? So, uh, well, it depends when your outlook is to buy. So if you have no intention to buy imminently, then then perhaps you don't need a pre-approval today, but that also means that you probably shouldn't be home hunting for a house. And and then there's also the conversation that we can, have a con we can assess your file and tell you what you qualify for today and say, if your income goes up by this much, you'll qualify for this much tomorrow. Or if you have a bigger down payment, you'll qualify for more or less tomorrow. So we can run multiple simulations and not necessarily have a pre-approval. The term pre-approval means that we have collected income confirmation, looked at your credit report, and are holding a rate specific to your file. However, we could just as easily just assess your file, not hold a rate, that's not called a pre-approval. Ultimately, we did the same exercise. I would say, I would say based off that, uh, if I may, Chris, like we've had clients that maybe reach out to Chris and where, um, Perhaps they're expecting a pay raise in the next six months, but it's more a game plan based off of the initial pre-approval where professionals like Chris that would be able to uh, evaluate your file today, run hypotheticals, but more so they're there to build a file with you long-term, if that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, sorry, just in conclusion, does a pre-approval necessarily mean your approved rate, like are you approved mortgage? Or can you get a, a pre-approval and then 
before you actually approve for when you buy the house? Yeah, so a pre-approval simply means based on today's information, you qualify for a certain loan amount, assuming a certain rate, and we are holding this rate so that if you do buy within these parameters, you will not pay more because this rate is guaranteed. It's a ceiling. However, when, you work, when you're working with a banker and especially a mortgage broker, realistically, we use that pre-approval as a safety net. We always tell people, this pre-approval we have for you is not at the very best rate that exists today. There's plenty of lenders that will give you a better rate if it's a real purchase, which means at the time of, once you have an accepted offer to purchase with Norton, we're gonna have a, an hour long dialogue around what all of the options are, and then you're going to pick the options suitable for you. It might not be the lender rate or term that was on your pre-approval. And uh, when it comes to pre-approvals, typically, most commonly, we don't go and, uh, as, like we don't dive deep into should we take a three year or five year fix and, and go through that dance because um, for the borrower and for the broker it's, it's kind of a waste of time we just want to make sure we know what the ceiling is and then you feel comfortable home renting that's the real goal okay. Great. Thank you. yeah you're welcome awesome any other questions on oh. so, uh, yeah. so I'm a parent of a potential first time home buyer so I just had a couple of questions um, first of all I have the time with some young people they um, they said the general guidelines seem to be four times your income. Um, right now it's about 4.25 okay. times your income. The, the loan amount would be 4.25 times your income roughly. And I say, I say it roughly because that assumes you have no debt. Yeah. Um, and it also assumes that uh, so the higher the purchase price, the more the property taxes will be. So it will skew the numbers. Mm -hmm. And if you're buying a condo, it will be impacted. So you've got the right idea, I would say. Okay. And one more thing is uh, I didn't realize that you could co-sign. So what's involved in that? Like, yeah. Does it depend on like the parent's income and the, the young adult's income? That's, or? A, that's a great question. It's one I, I, I answer every single day. So um, first of all, there's, there's multiple terms that kind of all sound the same. So there's co-signer, there's co-owner, and there's guarantor. So in the mortgage world, co-signer really is just a fancy word to say co-owner. So you are on title and you become part owner of this house. And due to that, and because we're using your income to help qualify, it means that we've collected income confirmation, looked at your credit profile, and we've also taken into account perhaps what your mortgage payments might be, what your car loan might be, and all that good stuff. So um, adding a, a co-signer, whether it's a parent, a sibling, uh, in general is a nice idea and generally we're able to find a way to get the borrower to qualify for more but i would remind especially for some home buyers that mom and dad uh have good jobs but they also have car loans and, and a mortgage to pay themselves and so it's not an automatic that that you will help buy a, a significant amount sometimes it's roughly the same number and the other question we talk about on that and i'll, I'll circle back but the other uh, part of that is if we're adding a co-signer that means that the borrower's income is not strong enough to qualify. That means that they probably can't truly afford the payment. So the next question becomes, we can add a cosigner, get you to qualify. How will you actually make the payments? The lender doesn't really ask those questions. My job is just to make sure that you're gonna be okay. Um, if you wanna proceed or not proceed, ultimately that's the borrower's decision. Um, so so I, to circle back on the, the comment about the cosign, there's also the, the term guarantor. That essentially means that you are guaranteeing the loan. You are not on title of the property. However, most lenders do not accept guarantors. And that is because historically, guarantors were mostly used when we needed additional support from a credit standpoint. Maybe the first time home buyer didn't have much credit. And so we wanted stability in the application. So we would add a guarantor. We would still go through the motions of collecting income and all of that. Um, but it was mostly from a credit standpoint. There's a few exceptions as to why we might have a guarantor today, but it's, it's few and far between. The best example that I would say from a guarantor standpoint is perhaps mom and dad are um, CEOs of a, of a company and they have some, some form of liability. We can all agree, when I say we, I mean the lender can agree that perhaps it's better that mom and dad aren't on title of that uh, specific home, and so they're okay with guaranteeing the loan. But otherwise, there's not a ton of exceptions to be had. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Yep. For uh, God forbid someone passed away that was co-signing uh, on this, 
I know just from like a bank account standpoint that defaults to the other owner as like their asset in the estate. Is the same for houses if your parents co signed with you? That's that guy. <laughs> I know the answer. But <laughs> so this is almost like a related question because yeah. when we go with co signer, co borrower, co owner, you need to be registered on title and we do that um, on closing. Um, there's two options. You can do title as joint tenants where you own the asset jointly or as tenants in common where there's a percentage of ownership. What you're referring to there, like a bank account, you're owning that bank account jointly. It's your right of survivorship. When you pass away, the survivor inherits that asset yeah. and you have tax advantages when it comes to that. With tenancy in common, it is a strategy that we use, especially with co-signers and, and co-owners, because we want to avoid capital gains consequences for the person who's not living there. Right? There's an exemption to capital gains for your, for your, for your principal residence. And so what we do is we give about 1% to the co-signer, 99% to the person who's going to be living there, and then we also have them sign the like trust declaration saying that they're, they're holding the 1% in trust for the 99% owner um, for financing purposes. And so to answer your question, it depends. You can also strategically take title as joint tenants, but then you do have to have a discussion with your accountant um, when it comes to the tax side. Uh, obviously, if you die and you do own 1%, you do have to probate for the for the will, and so there is another challenge there to discuss with the estate lawyer. Yeah, in, in addition to that, uh, just because you're different percentage ownership, the ownership percentage is irrelevant to the mortgage side. And, and I say that from the standpoint that every applicant, every co-borrower, every co-signer, everyone on the file is 100% responsible for the loan. Individually, every person is 100% responsible. So if one person doesn't pay, the mortgage pay is payment is still 100% the responsibility of the other person. Regardless of the proportion yeah. in ownership of the property on top. Yeah. yeah. Awesome, any other questions? Yeah. For a first time home buyer, what's the minimum down payment? Yeah. Uh, so, for all buyers, not only first time home buyers, the minimum down payment is 5% of the purchase price, so long as the purchase price is under 500000 If the purchase price is above 500000 let's call it 999000 then it's 5% of the first 500 and 10% of the remaining number up to the 999. If you hit a million as a purchase price, doesn't matter who you are, you have to have at least 20% of the purchase price as a down payment. And then lastly, most lenders will have a sliding scale. So if you're buying a home that is $2 million, for example, each lender will have their own individual requirements to say, well, on the last 500K, we want 50% down. So they'll, they'll kind of scale it up. But typically, it's the million or less that people are asking about, and that's the answer. You repeat the second one. You said it was 5% for under 500. Yeah, so five, uh, let's say you're, you're buying a house that's more than 500, less than a million. Yep. Uh, anywhere within that price point, you have to have 5% of the first 500,000 and 10% of the remaining number. So if you buy for 750,000, if my math is right, it's 25,000 for the first 500, 25,000 for the next 250, so it's a total of 50,000. Um, I'm assuming that uh, when purchasing a home, you can, it's on your side, you can go conditional or unconditional. Right. As supply got lower during uh, COVID times, or I guess uh, last couple of years, more unconditional purchases happened. But why would you ever go unconditional? Or why, yeah, why would you ever go unconditional as opposed to go unconditional? It just seems like a much better, better route. Right. That's a really good question. Actually, if we have the clicker. Just go into the Okay. Uh, Scott, you able to see this diagram? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So from this offer, right? So if we're right here, we've offered. There that seller has the option to accept, reject, or counter a set offer, right? Relative to that, conditional, unconditional, right? So these two right here. The question being, for example, why? Like why would you ever do that? So say, let's use the example of the panelists. So Alex is a buyer, Chris is a buyer, and myself, I'm a buyer, right? So on this property, there's three offers on the property, right? We're not able to know the contents of what their offer is, right? So their representatives that are representing them don't know what 
or I'm, I'm, in, I'm unable to know what the contents of their reserves, right? But in the eyes of the seller, if you think about it in the eyes of the seller, if it's two unconditional offers versus mine that's conditional, very likely there's a better chance that they're taking theirs right off the bat, right? Within the contents of that, you usually go price, conditions, deposit, and closing day as the four key factors, if you will, right? Um, but to answer your question directly, of why would you ever go unconditional? Simply put, I would say market dynamics of if you're looking to purchase that price at that time or that house at that time. But it's not to say that um, I'll run you through a scenario of when we were going unconditional. It's not to say, like John would say, like we didn't have, it's not to say there was no inspections ever being done per se. It was on a lot of purchases, say that house that we also all have an offer in on, three of us. It might be that you're pre inspecting that property with the unknown if you're actually gonna inspect the, or actually win that property, right? So say I pre-inspected it, but Chris actually won, was the winning offer. In theory, I spent $500 on inspection and I didn't win the property, right? But in that dynamic, it's where going unconditional was a lot of the dynamics of what the market was, but it, you would also be consulting somebody like Chris on the finance side of those two conditions of, hey Chris, how do we look for this mortgage, right? It was. Of course, Alex mentioned there was definitely some scary stories of people that went unconditional and they had to default, but there is definitely a line of due diligence before then of if you were to go unconditional where you committed to that purchase, right? So, does that answer your question? Yes, yeah, so it just increases the speed at which you want Speed and, well, the, at that point, the property's firm, it's sold, right? Yeah. But it's more that in a competing situation, which in a low interest rate and more offers, that was the reality of the likelihood of them taking my conditional offer to fulfill these two things where there's, they're telling the seller I'm buying it tomorrow, yeah, essentially. Exactly, right, so, yeah. Any other questions on the real estate? Right. Yeah. More so from a strategic standpoint versus a financial learning. Right, so like say for example right here, there's said offer that was sent in, correct? It's conditional or unconditional where Chris and Alex's offers are unconditional where it's signed docs and it's, it's now a sale my conditional offer in theory is financing inspection. In theory, there's two things that could go, go wrong there on my front, right? There's two out clauses on here from my point of view where theirs are, I'm buying it tomorrow, if you know what I mean, yeah. Any other questions on the real estate front? Perfect, okay, back there. Thanks for, uh, thanks for taking the time, guys. We really appreciate it. We're gonna be doing uh, the rounds as well in terms of any additional questions or more uh, personal base questions. There's food back there is catered by Farmer's Pick. Uh, some sandwiches as well as some uh, uh, some Italian treats and some uh, veggie platter back there as well. So thank you very much guys.